About five years ago, I met a wise and wealthy man who had spent his entire life studying success. And he'd reached a clear conclusion concerning the reason for success in life and especially in business. He's dead now, but I'll never forget what he told me because I immediately recognized that he put the finger on my reason for success and yours, as we'll talk about in a minute. He said the key to success was to set a goal and then to stay with it until you achieve success in at least one important thing. He said that your subconscious mind will then accept that success experience and store it as a pattern, like a template. And then from then on, your subconscious will drive you and direct you and guide you to repeat the pattern of success in, in other things that you attempt. Another way of saying it is that nothing succeeds like success. Psychologists have demonstrated that achievement brings you a natural high. Once you've experienced your first great success, then not only are you unconsciously programmed to repeat it, but nothing else will ever give you the same wonderful sense of satisfaction. All high achievers know that. Anyway, I learned the truth of this idea many years ago when I first started traveling. I spent eight years traveling around the world. And in many ways, a trip or a journey is a metaphor for life. My first big trip was that and much, much more. It had such an enormous impact on me that I've never really gotten over it. Uh, my whole life has been different as a result of what I call the Sahara Crossing. Let me tell you about it. When I was 18, three friends and I decided we'd go off and see the world. Uh, we were well out of high school and uh, we were laboring in sawmills on the West Coast. This is in 1963 and a lot of our friends were heading for Europe to travel around with backpacks. So we decided to do something different. Nobody else was going to Africa, so we decided we'd go to Africa. Of course, it never occurred to us to ask why it was that no one else was going to Africa. <laughs> and that was our first mistake. Uh, after working and saving for a year, uh, the four of us piled into an old 1946 Chevy and drove out of Vancouver, bound for Montreal via Toronto. Actually, we just passed a couple of blocks from here on our way on that trip. Uh, it was late at night when we left. It was pouring rain. We were all 20 years old and we were off to see the world. Anyway, I learned later that almost every great venture begins with an act of faith like driving into the dark, into the unknown. In a way, nature protects us by shielding us from knowledge of the difficulties and obstacles that lie ahead. Because if we really knew all the problems we would face, the setbacks, the suffering, the temporary failure, and the disappointments, many of us would hesitate about ever even starting out at all. And our plan was to drive across country to Montreal, get jobs on ships to work our way across the Atlantic, and then head south across Europe to Africa. Pretty basic plan. Uh, however, as it happened in Montreal, one of the guys decided to give up and go home. And so he left us. Well, that left three. The other two, after one day, still remember that, after one day of looking for work on the waterfront, decided to quit. Decided to quit trying and to spend their limited savings to pay their way across the Atlantic, rather than to work their way. I tried to talk them out of it. I told them that quitting is a habit. If you quit the first time you run into difficulties, you'll always quit when the going gets rough. You will, in effect, establish a pattern for failure rather than a pattern for success. But their minds were made up, so we split our savings and they took passage on a ship to England. I worked on a construction site in Montreal, hauling heavy things for the entire winter. And then I got a job on a Norwegian freighter out of Halifax and in late February and arrived in England in mid-April. As I had predicted, my friends had quit and stayed in England working at odd jobs. However, we soon made up, good buddies again. Once more, we headed for Africa. This, at this time, we, all we had was an eight and a half by 11 inch page about this size uh, that had Europe and Africa all on the same map on the same page. And it seemed to be a very simple thing to go from London, which was up here, to Johannesburg, which was down here. And it's just one page. And I mean, we sort of drew a straight line and we thought, you know, well, <clears throat> oh yes, there was a little orange part right across the, sort of a band right through the middle there called the Sahara Desert. But we thought, well, we'd just whip over that and get down to the green part on the map. Uh, there's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm, I'm, without a word of a lie, this is true. We didn't stop to think that the total distance was about 8,000 miles. See, we were big picture people. We didn't let ourselves get bogged down with details. We were young and we hadn't learned that it's the details that get you every single time. So we took a train down to London, there we bought bicycles. See, we never heard of anyone riding from London to Johannesburg on bicycles, so we decided that we would do it first and become famous. <laughs> that was another mistake. As soon as you, we soon learned that when you ride bicycles across France in the springtime, you find that the hills are all uphill and the wind is always in your face. <laughs> so likewise, I found that when you embark on any new venture, you often find the same thing. Everything seems to go wrong, usually at the worst possible time and in the worst possible and most expensive way, like starting a new business or a new career. Anyway, after two weeks of grinding along on bicycles uphill the whole way, 
which seems like a geographical impossibility, but it's true. Uh, we said the heck with this. We loaded the bikes on a train and we rode across France and Spain to Gibraltar. There we sold the bicycles and bought a Land Rover with our last dollar. So now we had a little problem. We were out of money. We'd exhausted our meager finances uh, buying the Land Rover and we didn't have enough money for fuel and equipment. So we all sat down. We considered ourselves great uh, writers at that time. We all sat down and wrote letters to everybody that we knew pleading for money telling them how desperate our case situation was. Sitting here, looking across the Straits of Gibraltar to Africa, all we needed was just a little bit of money to get us over there. Anyway, we got eventually we got a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, and then we got one big score. I'll never forget this. An uncle of Jeff's that he'd only seen once in his life sent us 100 pounds. 100 pounds at that time was $300, worth more than $1,000 today. And we were ecstatic, <laughs> we were saved. <laughs> so this was another lesson. Nobody ever makes it on their own. One of the great lessons of life. We all need help from others to get over the rough spots. Well, with the additional money, we loaded up with food and supplies. We took the ferry over to Tangiers in Morocco, and then we headed out of Tangiers toward the Atlas Mountains in the Sahara, full of excitement, singing as we drove down the road. 20 miles out, the radiator blew up. The radiator was just the beginning. Over the next 10 days, the steering rods bent and threw the front wheels out of alignment, so the tires blew one by one. When we got a flat tire, and we got lots of flat tires, we had to sit by the side of the road patiently, sometimes for hours, until somebody came along with the proper tools to help us change the tire. But we pressed on anyway. As we drove deeper into Morocco, and over the Atlas Mountains, and onto the Sahara Escarpment, we entered into a world that had changed very little in a thousand years. There were long, long stretches of barren country roads, and an occasional oasis surrounded by primitive farms, which was irrigated from wells and underground rivers. And that began an experience that I still remember quite clearly, and I think you'll be able to relate to this. By this time, I was speaking French fairly well. Uh, we could converse with the natives in the occasional small towns that we passed through. And in one town, early in, our, early in our slow, halting trek across Morocco, someone asked us where we were headed. And we told them that we were going across the Sahara and into Africa. And he said, oh no, he said, you can't do that. He said, you'll die in the desert. Well, I looked up my dictionary quickly because I didn't understand the expression. Vous allez mourir dans le roost. We then began to hear this on a regular basis everywhere we went. <laughs> We'd stop in a small town and people would bring their friends up to us and introduce us as the, as the young men who were going off to die in the desert. <laughs> well, they seemed quite cheerful about it, but, uh, but after a while we found it kind of irritating. I mean, and, 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 <laughs> and by the way, these were not your average Arabs. These were Bedouin and Tuareg. These were desert people, uh, members of tribes that lived in the Sahara for a thousand years. I mean, they were in a position to know what they were talking about. Uh, and, and I learned a valuable lesson from this. I learned then and for the rest of your life, whenever you try to do something out of the ordinary, people will line up to tell you that you can't do it, why you can't do it, that you'll lose your time, you'll lose your money, that you will, in effect, die in the desert. Even people who should know better will try to discourage you. To achieve anything greater worthwhile, you must train yourself to rise above these people, ignoring them and pressing on towards your goal regardless. Your time is your most valuable asset, and your ability to use your time, to spend your time well, largely determines your success and your income and everything that happens to you. And this brings us to what we call the law of forced efficiency. Now, the law of forced efficiency says there is never enough time to do everything, but there's always enough time to do the most important tasks. When you start to get under the gun, you have tremendous pressure. You have to have a job or task or project complete by a certain time. It's amazing how efficient you become. You become forced to be efficient. So the key in using the law of forced efficiency is to get really efficient before you run out of time. And the way you do it is you ask a couple of questions. One of the questions you ask is, what are uh, my most valuable tasks? What are my most important tasks? What are the things that you do each day that are more important than anything else? Another question you can ask is, why am I on the payroll? What results have you been hired to accomplish? Of all the results that you can accomplish, what are the most important results that you could accomplish today? It's amazing. If you ask entrepreneurs, what, uh, how important are sales to your business? You know what they'll say? Oh, well, they're very important. Then if you follow entrepreneurs around for any period of time, one study showed that the average entrepreneur spends 11% of his time on sales and marketing. And the other 89% of the time is spent just doing busy work. And of course, once you start to do busy work, the busy work increases and increases almost like rabbits multiply. A third question you can ask for the law of forced efficiency is what can I 
and only I do, that if done well, will make a real difference. Every hour, there's an answer to this question for you. What can you and only you do that if done well, will make a real difference? This means that if you don't do it, nobody else will do it. But if you do do it and you do it well, it can make a difference to your life and to your business. And the final question for forced efficiency is this. What is the most valuable use of my time right now? This is the greatest of all questions in time management. And all the books and tapes and courses and time management systems all come down to the answer to this question. What is the most valuable use of your time right now? Whatever your answer to that question is, minute by minute and hour by hour, be sure that you're working on that and not something else, and you'll become one of the most efficient people in your business.